Thank you for watching the show tonight. You've tuned in to Truth and Justice with Vivian King. This is a show where I try to educate the Houston community about criminal, the criminal laws of the state of Texas through telling people's real stories. Thank you for tuning in again tonight. Tonight we have something really good. It's a hot topic in the news this week and last week. Uh, I have in the studio Mr. Uh, Johnny Binder who is well known in the community as Minister Jeremiah. He does a lot of ministry work in the courthouse and all around the city. He's had a very colorful life. Um, he has done a lot of things in his life. He's very well known. He's a little flamboyant, uh, but he's been charged with a crime recently, a crime called barratry. So tonight we'll be looking into what is barratry? What is the crime of barratry? We never hear that term. It's very rarely used but it is being used on him. There will be times when I'll stop him because his case is fresh. He hasn't even been to court yet, and I don't want anything that he says to be used against him. But we will be exploring the crime of barratry tonight and speaking with my very special guest, M Minister Jeremiah. Minister Jeremiah, let's just get right into it. Uh, tell, us, tell me a little bit about yourself. Number one, I want to thank you for being on your show. It's wonderful to be on the show with the number one lawyer. First time African American ever been a number one lawyer in the state of Texas. So I'm honored to see a black woman inspire the young girls like Michelle Obama. So me and my people say to you, we keep going and uh, we hate to see you win judgmentship, but you're a wonderful person and you saved a lot of people's life and we thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that recognition. Um, my life is a beautiful stir and it's some blocks in it, but some good blocks because when they done what they did, they got me to God. So but let's talk, let's talk about where you were born. Were you born in, were you, a lot of people in crime or come from broken homes, uh, but you came from a, a solid home with a great solid. father, great mother, your mother's still alive. Uh, what side of town were you born in? I was born in Fifth Ward in a few years there, left there and went to Cloverland, a brand new community, and left that community and went to um, Park. Well, it was for Army, so it's why you see Burma, Pearl, and Doolittle. All the streets come from overseas. It was for war. It was for war veterans. My daddy was a war veteran, so he was able to get that and other house. So I was blessed. My father had a construction company, so I had no reason to wind up in crime. So and he I, was a prominent, uh, well-established man in the black man. community, businessman yes, in the black yes, community in the uh, 40s and 50s. Very successful. Okay. Um, did he teach you his craft? I was a master brick mason. I started throwing bricks in the hole at first. I was seven years old. While she was having fun, I was at work most of the time. He, I, you know, but he let me play baseball. I became number one baseball player. And I didn't know I could go all the way to the pros. Cause Oklahoma had sent for me. I, had, I was playing shortstop, and I could hit the ball out the park at any time. But I didn't know to take that talent that far. But make a long story short, my father was a good man. He died in 1982, March the 1st or 2nd. And when I left him, I was waving at him in the back of a police car on the way back to prison. They let me out for three days. Grant Hardaway got me out. I went to prison for something I did not do, not once but twice. And the five witnesses took the witness stand and said I was Wait, wait, wait. Before, before you skip that far, let's talk about, um, you said you went to prison for something you didn't do. Now, tell me, I think you told me off camera you went to prison in 1979. Is that yes, correct? Describe <coughs> what happened to send you to prison. You were charged with robbery <coughs> of a jewelry store. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Yes, ma'am. And um, tell me about that. You said you were in Dallas when it happened. So how did you get to be the, the number one suspect uh, in a robbery? It was, uh, I was in Dallas. The robbery happened at 1.05, 1 o'clock on Fountain View in West Ham at Bullock's Jewelry Store. In the daytime or? In the daytime on a Saturday. Okay. On May 26, 1979. Okay. Um, if not May, it was March. So, um, the jurist... You're not under oath here, so you can make mistakes. Okay. So, the jurist old man, um, and I've never seen him, he never seen me, and I brought five people from Dallas, Grant Holloway, attorney law, was my lawyer. I had one Caucasian, four blacks to come fly to Dallas and told the people I was getting my hair fixed, which would look like yours. I had a Jerry Curl, Scary Curl, and I had a, 
uh, Diamond in my mouth at the time. And um, I was in Dallas doing my thing. You what know? were you doing in Dallas? I was in Dallas gambling and having fun and young and handsome and doing my thing. You know? <laughs> you know? And you wore long hair then, so you yeah. went to a beauty shop and had your hair done. And, uh, I had my hair done at 110. The Rob had my 105. I signed in. The handwriting analysis looked at it and said, this is his handwriting. The two beauty shops, Dodd and Lucky and Lyndon Lucky, came from the beauty shop, came to Houston with a license. Say we fixed his hair at 110. <clears throat> the Rob had 105. I left there and went to the beauty shop to, to the, get my, get, buy something to eat. And the lady, the white lady was there, which was in a wheelchair. We had to, I don't know how we got her there, but we got her there some kind of way. We flew her to Houston. She took the witness stand, a Caucasian lady. She said, no, he was in uh, the restaurant with me. In Dallas, after in Dallas. he got his hair done. And then when I went to the room, before my hair was done, uh, the security guard knocked on the door, said, you got to pay your room rent. I said, well, my, my late friend, she he said, no, you can pay it now and come out this room. I say, huh? And I'm glad he did that. I put on some clothes. He stood at the door with his gun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I walked to the door. I said, sir, what I do? One of these robocops. I said, he said, you got to leave here until you pay the rent. They put the lock on the door. I went to the front. I called. I said, somebody bring me some money, man. So the people drove up and gave me $1,000. I went back. I paid my room rent. What more than $100? And I went back to the room. Good thing he did it. So the security guard came. He said, no, at 12 something, he room rent. So at that time, I couldn't have got on the plane and flew to Dallas, still couldn't have robbed no bank, and then been back getting my hair fixed. So let me make sure I understand. So you got charged with robbery, a robbery of a bullock jewelry store at 1 o'clock in the daytime on a Saturday in Houston. However, your alibi was that even though somebody got on the witness stand and pointed and said it was you that robbed me while you were sitting in trial, is that correct? Yeah, the owner. The owner of Bullock's said, no, you are the man that that robbed me. Mm -hmm. You brought in witnesses in your defense, which the Constitution allows you to compel, subpoena, and bring witnesses to testify in your defense. You brought five people. You brought the security guard at the motel in Dallas that had a, 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 a confrontation with you with a gun, so he knew it was you. You brought two ladies that did your hair. You brought your lady friend that was with you, and you brought a lady at a restaurant. Yes, ma'am. All five people testified that you were in Dallas between 12 o'clock that day and 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and a jury still convicted you? Yes, ma'am. And, um, and, and what did the jury give you? 18 years. The, the, the son said, I don't think that's him. But the father, Bullock Jr., said, I don't think it's him. The father said, that's him. One guy said it was me. Five people took the witness stand and said it wasn't me. Everybody in the courthouse know I won the case. They deliberated for two or three days. They came back and say guilty and judge Joe Keegan court. And I told Judge Joe Keegan. So that was a 230th district court. Yes, it was. Look at you. I, and that was one of the best judges in the world to me. I said, Judge, this is not right. She said, Bye. I said, the Judge, this is not right. I wasn't in town. She said, if you prove to me you weren't in town, I give you a new trial. Three years later, a guy named Scott Carpenter went to... Uh, that, what was Scott Carpenter's position? He was a DA. He was a Harris County DA. DA. Yes, he was. Okay. He went to uh, Stanley Snyder and sent word to him that Johnny Bonner didn't do it. I can't sleep. I ain't been able to sleep for three years. Wow. Uh, I've been telling all the head DAs that this is not right. He just told me this about a year ago when me and uh, Ronald Ray was in Fort Bend, which is where he is now. He'll be a part of my movie, American Gangster. <laughs> and uh, I, I hugged We're him. We're not talking about that today. Okay. I hugged him. I, I hugged him because to see a white man, a DA, tell the truth like that, it brought tears to my eyes because I'm so glad to see somebody on the other side to tell the truth, but it's not enough of him. And I said, Mr. Carpenter, I know why you're in for being now. He said, John, I couldn't stand that system. I had to leave it. And he left. And uh, he's now assistant district attorney in Fort Bend. And he said he's going to tell the truth. He, they knew from day one it wasn't me. But the dude said, let's go, Jay. My nickname was JJ. He had a yellow Fleetwood. I had a yellow Fleetwood. So they matched me up. But, he, but Scott looked and told the head DA, look, this is Johnny Bonner didn't do this. This is Marie Terrell people in California did this, which is out of Louisiana. He told the head DA. The head DA told him to shut up. He went across the street over his head and told it. So this happened in 79. That's before stores had surveillance cameras mm -hmm. and cell phones and things mm -hmm. like that. So it just had to be somebody matching a car that 
that ran from the scene and mm -hmm. trying to put together who it could have been. But, but I had five witnesses, six with the lady with me, and all of them proved that I was in Dallas. Uh, my, the, the, the two ladies from the beauty shop, the lady from the uh, 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 restaurant, and the security guard police from the hotel. So all my witnesses was legitimate. None of them ever been in trouble, not one of them. All of them was taxpayers. And the jury believed one white guy against five other people, six other people. Who was the prosecutor on your case? Do you remember? No, I just, he was in the front of Scott Cobb, and he will remember. I don't know his name, but I will get it. And okay. And, and I just want to say uh, to the listening audience, we want to tell true crime stories and educate people. We want jurors who are fair and impartial and understand why uh, inner city people, minority people, all people need to come to jury duty. I was a Harris County prosecutor that did the right thing, and many Harris County prosecutors do the right thing. So uh, even though Minister Jeremiah had this bad experience, I don't want people to go away thinking that all prosecutors are bad because prosecutors are there to uh, try to do the right thing. Uh, but we are telling his particular story, so I'm just giving you that caveat, and his story was not a good story um, now, as it comes to that. I'd like to say something what you said. I have prosecutors as my friend. A lot of them, I love them and uh, play basketball with some of them. I love them. They're right. good people. I'm not sitting up here saying all prosecutors right. bad. And I know I'm not, not saying all police bad. I'm not saying all pastors good. So what I'm saying to you, it's a lot of them, I don't know the percentage, that co come there to convict, convict, convict. Then you got some prosecutors not there for that. They're there for justice. And right. them the ones that I respect. And right. Scott Carpenter is one of the uh, DAs I respect. And, and, one of the, and the prosecutor's oath is not to convict, but to see the justice done. I took that oath in 1992, and uh, many prosecutors do just that uh, on a daily basis. So I just want to add that caveat as we tell his story. Um, so you ended up having to go to prison from 79 to, 83. to 1983. And what remarkable happened in 83 to get you out of prison? Was it your parole was up at that no. time, or did no. somebody actually get you out? No. How did you get out? No, I had a new trial. Scott Carpenter, the DA, said he couldn't sleep. He got the word to me. I hired an investigator. He called Stanley Snyder. Stanley Snyder got in wind of it. I raised twenty thousand dollars from the prison. I sent to I, I paid Stan. I paid, they, and they brought all the evidence back. The girl Marie Terrell, who robbed her and her husband, she came back, and she testified it was me. And judge, she said it was her. Yeah, her. She, and her she told the truth that it was her. Her and her husband did it. Wow. They gave her a lot of tech tests. They gave me one. She passed it. I passed it. Uh, what was her name, Marie what? Marie Terrell. She was in Chevy Chase Penitentiary in California. And they're going to be a big part of my movie. So she, what happened, Judge O'Keegan's hand was tied because I was still in the appeal court. And she said, well, Mr. Binder, I promise you something. I said, yes, you did, Judge. It was a few days before Thanksgiving. She said, well, Mr. Binder, uh, I'll probably be in jail with you in a few minutes because I don't have the right to do what I'm going to do. But I, in my heart, I know now that you did not rob that store. And you told me you didn't rob that store. And by you not robbing that store, I told you I would let you go. Get on the phone, call your mother. Bailey, don't send him back over there. What? Walk him back over there and let him go. What? I never went back. They walk, I, I got released faster than anybody in the state of Texas. I'd never heard of that before. Yeah, she wouldn't let me, they, the handcuffs take me back. She said, no, take the handcuffs off. What? Walk him over there. What? And Joe Keegan's is dead now, Judge Joe Keegan's. Oh, my God. If, and, uh, and nothing happened to her for doing that? They, they didn't no, do anything? No, the governor, Mark White, went with her. He saved her. Mark White. he pardoned went, you, didn't he? He gave me a, no, he gave me a full pardon. A full pardon. He gave me a full pardon. Mark White came behind her a week later and said, Joe, 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 Joe Keegan done was right. I agree with her. We're giving Johnny Bonner a full pardon. He was not at that store. He did not rob that store. They gave me a full pardon and wiped my slate clean. Wow. So you got the full pardon in 1983. Yes, ma'am. And the effect of a full pardon, which is so rare today, uh, Mark Wright was a Democratic uh, governor um, back in, I know he was a governor when I got out of college in 1980. That probably was, was about the end of his reign. Uh, but a full pardon gives you the right to say, I've never been convicted before of a crime. I mean, it's not on your record, it's completely expunged, and you can say it never happened. I mean, that's the legal right that you have. And I won my lawsuit right after that. I sued him for putting me in jail for three years, and I won my lawsuit. Wow. And um, George O'Keefe became the greatest person in my life, besides Jesus. Who was that? 
Judge Joe Keegan. Joe Keegan. Okay. The judge became the greatest person in my life besides Jesus Christ. Wow. That's fabulous. And then after that, um, I know you had, um, so you have no criminal record as it comes to stateside, but then you did get involved with one of the first RICO cases in the federal system. 1987, uh, November 12th, I got a no bill for RICO Act, conspiracy, continuing criminal enterprise, tax evasion. A few days later, December 14th, they reindicted me with Marie Preston. They wanted me to tell on Marie. They said if I tell on Marie Preston, they would let me go. I wouldn't tell it. And we had nine lawyers. Uh, Denise Collins was one of our lawyers. We helped her be judged. Another one of our lawyers was uh, Craig Washington, congressman. David Biles, Ken Schaefer, uh, David Cunningham. So we had nine lawyers. And uh, yeah, I had a great uh, dream team at the time. Um, so this was a full case. Marie Preston and others were indicted in a conspiracy. Uh -huh. And it's my understanding, from what I know, because Marie Preston's been on the show telling her story, is that your only connection at that time was that you rented from her strip center. No, ma'am. Is that not right? She told the truth, but she didn't tell the whole truth. Okay. Well, I love her. I didn't rent, I bought it. Okay. Well, you. you I went to the bank and bought the strip center. Okay. All right. Well, no, uh, was that where the club was? Uh huh. Sophisticated lady. Okay. Yeah. All right. Correct. I had the first sophisticated lady in the city. Open up a, a, a women for a club for women. Men can come to it. I, I Could made, not come. No, I wouldn't let them come. I wanted the women to have a place. I wasn't even spiritual back then. I don't know what was wrong with me. I, sophisticated lady. I opened it up. First, it was for everybody. Then some told me let women have a special club. So I went and got a sportsman license and I let the women have a club to themselves. Well, they didn't come and do business and talk, and nobody could come, not even me. So you bought the strip center from Marie Preston. I probably misunderstood her. And then uh, you opened up a club called Sophisticated Ladies. Mm -hmm. So tell me how they tied... A 24-hour store. Everything was in the strip center, so MLK. Okay. And how did they tie you into her? Uh... Uh, when I bought the strip center, then I bought a, uh, a uh, Porsche from her, brand new Porsche, brand new Benz, and then I started running her club. And then all my artists. What was the name of her club? My Osha. Uh, my Osha. That's the one. Okay. On Tidwell and Homestead. Okay. All right. And she was one of the richest black women in the state of Texas. Okay. Tidwell and Homestead. Okay. That's uh -huh. what she was telling me about that club. Okay. Uh -huh. All right. And this, so, what happened with you in the federal case? Let's let's move to that. Uh, six years later, from five and a half, six years later, um, they come to me with that junk. Um, I was uh, upset for a while, from 83 to 85, 86. I opened up a children's foundation in 1985. In Fort Ward, I sent 3,000 children to school. The ch this will be in the movie. <clears throat> With brand new clothes, me and uh, the Baptist board, Pastor J.J. Uh, Robeson of uh, Miami Baptist Church. I went to him, I got a bunch of clothes, money, and my money, and I went to Fort Ward. I don't know why I fell in love with Fort Ward. I bought a club, I took the alcohol out of the club and turned it into a children's foundation. I had no 5-1-3-C, the only thing I had was money, and I started taking care of thousands of children. And, and this two, is before your federal case? Yeah, two years later, they got mad at me. I was out of the game. I was in the game for a minute. I was mad. And then I got out. I said, man, this ain't me. This ain't me. I seen a girl pregnant walking out of one of the drug houses I had, and when I seen her pregnant, and I thought about it, I had something to do with that, I started vomiting, crying. I, I, can't, I can't do it. I couldn't do it. I, I, I can't. If I'm doing something to hurt people, I don't want to do it. So it finally hit you that what you were a part of was no good. Right. Well, that, that's, that's a beautiful testament, and that was before you got in trouble with the feds. Catherine Griffin, she'll tell you. you know, oh, okay, yeah, I know her. I saved her life. Yeah. She, had, she was a dope fiend, prostitute. Uh, they, the dude was trying to kidnap her the whole nine yards. She's a beautiful lady. Yeah, she finna marry a dude on Channel 2. Just my personal friend. She was a dope fiend. I locked in her house, put bars on the house, put a Farrakhan tape in and throw her in there and left her in there and gave her food. I kidnapped her, stopped her from being a dope fiend. I'm the one. She'll tell you. And she was going to kill her baby. I wouldn't let her kill her baby. She called her baby Miracle. That's the baby's name? Yeah. Wow. I wouldn't let her. I said, you're not killing this baby. She said, well, how are we going to take care of it? I said, I'll take care of it. And I ain't never had no sex with her. I ain't never kissed her. I ain't never done nothing with her. I, I, had, I had to minister to me all the time, but I didn't know it. What year do you think that was? That was 1987, 88. Okay. Mm-hmm. But when I locked her up again is when I got out of prison in well, let's, 19... Well, let's, let's talk about, let's talk about, which we want to lead chronologically to the federal case. So 
that's when you're trying to change your ways, but yet you in, and go legit. You got the club. Uh, you're running a club for Marie. You own your own club, the uh -huh. ladies' club. Right. Uh, and then somehow the feds come at you. Tell us about that experience. Well, they come at me and told me that. Did they uh, catch you like at your house? No, no at way. the club? I no mean, way. How did I left town. They never called me. Never called me with aspirin. Never called me with anything. So you I, turned yourself in? No, Ken Schaefer called me. And uh, he had a little bit of office, a little bit of BMW, wasn't no well-named lawyer, but I liked him. I talked to him. I talked to Dick DeGuerre and Mike DeGuerre, and I was going to get him $250,000, but I didn't like how they was talking to me. Right. And uh, I went to Percy Farman office. I, I wasn't feeling it. I, all right. I could see, when you're bringing the money, when you're bringing the money. Well, Kent should have been a younger lawyer then at the time. He was very young. Nobody knew him. Yeah. But I could see the tenacity in him. smart, it. yeah. I said, you know what, young man? I'm giving you my money. He said, I'll fight like hell for you. All right. That's what I needed to hear. Right. So I said, well, I'm going to leave town. Because my two DA agents have already told me that Friday and Saturday that you're going to have a warrant for you on Monday. I Let's some... slow it down. Your DEA agents, that's the Drug Enforcement Agents officers. Oh, my friend. They had actually talked to you and yeah. told you that you're, they're about to indict you and there's going to be a warrant coming down in just a minute. On Monday. On Monday, okay. I sent them that Friday and that Saturday. And then what happened? I left town. I, right. left, I went to California. I had a children foundation and I had a, a, a diamond production. That's the only thing saying me. And that, now, children's foundation was local, but you would travel with it. No, I, I would travel with my music company. The diamond production. Diamond okay. production saved my life. I'd have got life no parole without that because they'd approved tax evasion. I made over a million dollars a year out of my uh, music company with Dougie Fresh and LL Cool J, Eric B. Rakim. I was doing a Say No to Drug tour. The time they indicted me, I was on tour, doing wow. a no drug tour. Wow. Doug and Fresh flew in and took the witness stand and told him how much money we make a year, and said Johnny makes over a million dollars a year from me. I was on tour. And I was out the game. And Doug Fresh still looks good. Yeah, me and him going back on tour right now. Good I just talked you. to him two days ago. He's gonna do an album with Jill Scott. Well, that's good. Mm -hmm. All right, so you had you had your children's foundation. Do you remember what the name of it was? I didn't ever name it. I just opened up Don Production and just. The Children Foundation didn't have a name. I just opened it. Just, okay, so it was just a part of what you did. I just wanted to do it. Right. I, I I don't know why I love children. I just love children. You wanted to give back to the community. Yeah. Okay. All right. And so, okay, I'm still trying to get you arrested. How did you get arrested? Uh, I called Ken Schaefer. He told me uh, they got a warrant for the arrest now. It was like on a week later. I said, well, I ain't coming. I said, until you give me a bond, I ain't coming. He said, well, let and me you go. know you can't do that in the federal system. You have to have a detention hearing. Okay. Uh, that's what he told me. He said, you got to come back. I said, well, you better go talk to them people. I said, because I'm gone. So I learned on about my business. I talked to some people. They were going to do some things for me, and uh, I wouldn't be the same person. And I thought about it. I prayed over it. I called my mother, and that did it. My mother said, if you don't bring your butt back here and prove that you didn't do this. I said, Mama, they, they crossed me before. I, I think they'll do it again. My mama said, come back here, boy. So I, I called Ken Shape. I said, look, man, set it up. I got in the car, I flew back in, dressed out, went to his office. I did a big interview with the press. He took me in, and three days later, I had a, a half a million dollar bond, and I made it. Now, do you think that because you are flamboyant, and because uh, I, I, I didn't know you in the 80s, I was a banker then, I wasn't a lawyer then, but I was out of college. I, I heard that you used to be at the Rockets games on the front row with your mink coats, and I guess your long hair, and you know, you were doing the do, and everybody knew you, and you had beautiful women on your arm. Do you think that jealousy and uh, your flamboyantness might have had a lot to do with that 1987 uh, federal case? A whole lot to do with it. Do you think it has something to do with your case now? Because, you know, you still, I mean, I'm sure you're not flamboyant like you were in the 80s, but, you know, you, you, you have a look. You know, you're always neatly dressed. You always have on a suit. You always have a, a baseball cap on. You know, you have your signature look, and you're always very friendly and gregarious and outgoing. outgoing. Do you think that, that, that people get jealous of that? Or? I know for a fact, uh, when, I'm glad you brought that up, when we sue, when we've uh, been working on uh, this young man, uh, Children's case, me and the lawyer, and we were talking about so filing a lawsuit on them for knocking the six teeth out and the 56 stitches. Heat started coming, I could feel it. Then another young guy, had a life sentence for robbing a uh, 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 T-Mobile store. And a week later, me and the investigative team and the lawyers, we found out, well, going through the paperwork, we found out he was in jail. I said, well, he was in jail. 
So we went back and got him out. And so this little lady on 351, they were so mad, they gave him five more robberies. And she was like, Johnny Binder. She was trying Oh, that's to, the uh, LaDondrell Montgomery case, right? Yeah. That we've, about, we've had on the show. Three, about right. two, three months ago, this when right. this happened. Right. So they told me then, uh, indirectly, we're going to get you. I said, I ain't doing nothing illegal, so come on with it. I, but I want to, uh, you, you skipping back now, I want to go back to uh, the federal case. Let's, let's just do this. How much time did they give you in the federal 40 case? years. 40 years. And uh, how long did you actually stay? I did 10 years. I went in September 1998, September 28th. I 1988? got out. September 1988, September uh, uh, 28th. And you got out in 1998. Got out in 1998, 10 days for 10 years. And you did something miraculous with that, didn't you? Have a 40-year a sentence, but somehow you got it reduced, and that's Me and unheard Marie, of. No, we didn't do that. We was on the old law because they couldn't prove conspiracy. Continue criminal enterprise, so we stayed on 86. We went 87. We never would have got out. So we did a fourth. You do four from time. We got 10 years. We was the most model prison besides Malcolm X. We was number one model prison. Me and her. I took every kind of class. Every she did too. We had every kind of certificate, speaking certificate, every, every kind of education. And I had a self improvement class in 26 prisons. I was number one most improved prison in the state of Texas and through the United States. How many different prisons were you in? 26. They kept shipping me because I was teaching the Word of God, and they were scared of me because I was able to bring everybody together. Wow, 26 different prisons. So you were going all around the country then. Yes, ma'am. So um, when I got out, five years went, and we found a law. Where you can go back and fight them in five years. Me and Marie went back and fought them, and Sheila Jackson Lee, uh, St. John Church and other people signed a letter and my parole officer and we sent it to Chubb Church, Maryland and I had uh, 25 years left and we beat it. You had 25 years left on supervised release? Yeah, we beat it. So now you're not on anything? I'm not on nothing. I got a passport. I'm going anywhere in the world. But, okay, so let's, let's talk about your ministry. Let's talk about um, the revelation. You're going from Johnny Binder to Minister now Jeremiah. Minister Jeremiah. Tell us about that transition. Well, I, Vivian, Miss, Miss King, I was in prison in 1984. Uh, was it 84, Jeremiah? No, I mean, excuse me, I'm about to 1994. I was in prison in Leavenworth, Kansas. They tried to kill me and 41 other people. They had just killed two people. Now, when him. you say they, who was they? A gang or was no, it the wardens? The, uh, no, the, the warden and his people. Tried to kill y'all? Yes, they did. Wow. Yeah, they killed people down there. So, Leavenworth, Kansas? Yes, ma'am, that's where I was. So I was walking down the hall, and they rushed me, and I don't want to fight the police, so I'm like, what's wrong? And they run up on me, because you hit one of the police, and you threw. It's over. So I'm like, what's, what y'all doing? Put the handcuffs on. I said, you're not putting no handcuffs on, because you put the handcuffs on the hall, they can stab you. Wow. I said, I'm not putting no handcuffs on, man. What's wrong with you? He said, well, step over here. I said, well, step me out of this hall. Step me out of the hall, they put the handcuffs on me, took me in the hole. I said, what are we going to hold for? He said, they just had a fight. The Christians and the Muslims and the child. I say, man, I teach the Muslims and the Christians. Ain't but one God. I ain't had them doing that. I just woke up. So it was doing Ramadan. So they put me in the hole. So we didn't eat for three days. If you don't eat for three days, it go to wash them and then make them come down and release you. So we didn't eat. Well, for how, how would anybody know if they don't report it to Washington? They have to report it because somebody die, the warden and everybody gets sued and go to prison themselves. So when people so who eat, reports it if you don't eat for three days? The one of them got a report. They so got, you just self starve. It's not like they're starving you. You just won't eat for three days. We wouldn't eat for three days because we knew. So that, you knew that would trigger a report. We wanted the, the media in there. Okay. The only way to get the media in there was not to eat. Okay. I so for you. three days, we told everybody, to get ready. We're not going to eat. Okay. We're not going to eat. So three days, we kicked the food back. So the warden came in there and said, Johnny Binder, you weren't doing this. I said, no, sir. They brought me out and they hit my head against the wall. And I started kind of bleeding just a little bit. And I uh, went back in, and I tied my shoes up. There was three of us in each cell. I said, hey, y'all, everybody ready? I said, it's on, baby. And about 200 of them in them gear. And I said, well, I guess I'm going to die. We got to die today. I'm going to die. I said, I'm gonna, I, said, I guess I'm going to die, but I'm going to take as many as I can. And God said, you fool. Did I tell you to do that? Take them shoes off. You can't take your head being busted and Jesus hung and died on the cross, and you can't take that, and you're going to get all these people killed because you got hit? You that arrogant? You can't take it? Your pride? Your ego? What is it? 
Don't talk to me like I'm talking to you right now, man. I, wow. I pulled my shoes off. I went back to the thing. I told everybody, hey, y'all, hey, hey, we're not fighting. Let peace be still. I want to be Marlon's king. <laughs> Let peace be still. Let peace that's be great. still. Peace be still. That's a beautiful That's a beautiful. So the thing. brothers took a vote and gave me the name Jeremiah. They said, brother, you are Jeremiah. I said, who? Jeremiah. I went to read the Bible for 18 hours by Jeremiah. So I wrote a letter to my mama. I said, Mama, I got to take the name Jeremiah. I and said, what's the significance of Jeremiah to you? He's a warrior for the people. He speaks for the poor. He's a spokesperson of what I do downtown. And I've been doing it everywhere in Dallas, San Antonio, Atlanta, Washington, D.C., Florida, L.A. So I don't just do it here. I just be here more. But uh, I ain't working with really good. We won, we won the first hanging case. Uh, we won the first. We won, we won the first hanging case. We won the first hanging case in uh, Conroe, and they hung uh, this brother seven years ago. Me and Willie Garrett, the biggest lawyer, lawsuit lawyer, billionaire lawyer. Right. We won that case. So I don't work with some of the biggest lawyers in the world, and ain't none of them never gave me a dime. Willie Garrett didn't give me nothing. Right. The family did, but Willie Garrett ain't never gave me nothing. Right. No lawyer. The family might, but ain't nobody. So it's a bunch of madness, and uh, that's how I got started. That's how I got my name. And uh, when I come out, uh, Pastor Jackson named me. And I, when I got a name by him, I had my ex from the nation. And people say, you're confused, you're confused. I said, no, I'm not. It's one God, it's one faith, it's one baptism. It's one God, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I went on with my life, and I've been successful in this ministry. And I want not about to stop me. I'm going to keep helping people. I will not stop. How old are you now? Thir 38. I'm really 40, but in my birthday, say 58. Because okay. 10 years I was in the incubator, and God was getting me ready for now. All righty, now that's so, the 10 years that you're in the federal prison. Yes. System. Okay. Well, let's get to your uh, current case. We're going to just educate people about the crime of barratry. Please. I think uh, Fox uh, 26 did a little story about it, and I think the title was Fake Lawyers, Doctors Out and About. So. Uh, Monday, you got charged with, uh, you got charged with a crime on Monday uh, called barratry, and that's very, very unusual. I'm going to read a little bit to the viewers just to let them know what one of the ways. It's like six different ways you could commit barratry, but it's under the Penal Code Section 3812, barratry and solicitation of professional employment, and it says a person commits this offense with intent to obtain an economic benefit, so it has to be for money, the person solicits employment either in person or by telephone for himself or for another. So uh, Minister Jeremiah has been charged with barristry and been accused of, which he is going to fight vigorously, he's been accused of <gasps> soliciting business for a lawyer, um, splitting fees with lawyers. Um, and it's a fine line. As a lawyer, we're told that we cannot split fees with non-lawyers. We can split fees with other lawyers, like co-counsel, if I want to pay from the fee, but I can't split my fee. I can pay a salary to someone that works for me. I can pay <coughs> someone for marketing. I can pay someone a bonus, but they have to either be 1099 or there has to be a W-2 where they're on a salary. So there is um, a fine line. I am told that I cannot go and solicit people in the courthouse. I'm a board certified criminal lawyer. All my work is in the criminal courthouses, uh, either state or federal. And I can't just go up to people and say, oh, you're looking for a lawyer? Or it, their case is reset to hire a lawyer. I can't say, oh, I'm a lawyer. Here's my card. Call me. That is illegal, um, and it is against our rules. But, and people can't do it. I can't send someone to do that for me either. So a person has to come to me. They ha I can advertise to invite people in, but I'm not supposed to call them myself or solicit them. I can respond. Um, if someone comes and says, are you a lawyer, which they do all the time, then I can give them my card. If they ask Johnny, are you a lawyer or do you work for a lawyer, and he, he can give someone that card. So I don't want to say him to say anything to incriminate himself that can be used against him, but I just want to talk about uh, what he's charged with. Now, usually our phones are ringing off the wall, and I don't have any calls tonight, so I don't know if the phones are working properly, because I have seen a little light uh, flash on, uh, but I don't know if the phones, uh, I don't know, okay, I hear my director saying they're on. So, um, Johnny, do you want me to read the charges uh, that are against you? Please. And uh, I want to solicit anybody that wants to talk about it. Oh, we got a phone call. 
Hello, caller, you're on. Thanks for calling. Hello, uh, how you doing? How you doing? I'm doing all right for old man. <laughs> uh, you sound good. Uh, oh, boy, thank you, thank you. Listen, uh, I wanted to ask uh, Minister Jeremiah, do he remember a guy named uh, Robert Miller? They called him Jukebox. And if he do, uh, is he still living or what is he doing now? I don't. I remember the name, but I don't know what Jukebox is doing at this time. Uh, since I've been home for the uh, last 14 years, I've been mostly just fighting for my people. I'm a minister, not a hip-hop minister. So I've been working with a lot of lawyers, work with them, not for them. And I'm trying to save many people's lives I can. And that's the ministry I do. And I'm not going to stop. Let me tell you one of the things I've noticed about him, too, since I've been seeing him at the courthouse and got to know him over the last 10 years, is uh, he doesn't drink, he doesn't smoke, and he won't go to clubs uh, unless he has to go for an occasion or someone's invited him. So he's, he's, he's definitely out the game from what I can tell. You know what? I believe. I believe him. I believe the Lord have called him. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I believe that uh, he's serious because uh, I re I don't know him personally, but I I remember his name back in the day. Right. The binder, and uh, he was treacherous. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to use that he was word. Treacherous. It's all right. He was he was uh, a, a booger bear, but I'm so glad to hear that now he's uh, in the ministry because if. Uh, if, uh, if the Lord can do it for Apostle Paul, he can do it for anybody. Thank you. So I just want to uh, encourage the brother to keep up the good work and uh, keep your hands in God's unchanging hand. And we're going to be uh, checking with you one day. If I need you, I know, I know, uh, I, I, I know how to reach you. You know, you can Thank always, you. you know, you can always Google me, and I can find him um, and be, uh, lift him up in prayer because he's about to go through another battle. Okay, that's all right. Uh, 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 God is with you. You know, over in the book of James, God said that uh, anyone that lacks wisdom, ask of God. He will uh, generously give it to you. So you keep your hands in God's and change your hand. Ask God to help you with that. And I believe in my heart that he will, uh, Brother Jeremiah. He will. Thank you for calling. Oh, you're welcome. Okay, I was going to read the charges. So the way uh, when someone is charged with a crime, the way... Uh, it's two ways that it can happen. Uh, you can be indicted first, which is rare in the state system. Usually they just arrest you, and then you're indicted within 90 days. Uh, in this case, uh, Minister Jeremiah, it's a complaint, and a complaint is when they do a probable cause warrant, and I was going to read that to you, but we got another call, so let's take this call. Thank you for calling. You're on. Calling, you're on. Hi, turn, your, turn, turn, your, turn your volume down so we can hear you. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Hi, this is to Jeremiah. Um, this is Carolyn and Tony Anderson. It's still on. And, you know, I, your volume I have is still on. Right, make you remember me by using other people that you know. My sister Mary Jo. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I was just calling you because we were sitting. Tony and I, my husband, we are sitting here just during the uh, set, and uh, we just wanted to call in and tell you too as well that we are praying for you. I've known you for over, I mean, I was like 16 years old when I first met you on Burma Street. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I know uh, I know the good person that you are, and, you know, and I've known you for a while, and I can see the change in you. We've met, my husband and I met with you uh, maybe five or six years ago, and we know the good that you're doing for the community, and we just want you to be encouraged, and we want you to know that we are praying with you and for you that you come through these uh, battles, these uh, criminal battles or whatever they got going on or whatever. But you, we just want you to know that we're, too, praying for you. And we love your show, ma'am. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And if you know anybody in the community that has a current case or a past case and they want to vent, just Google me and call me at my office, and I'll set up for you to come on. I'm doing this show to try to educate the community, the urban community. Uh, so we'll know a little bit more about the criminal justice system. And we're not just defendants. We participate. We can go to jury duty. We can be fair and impartial and not judgmental. This is our community. We want it to be safe, but we also want it to be fair. And we need to keep it fair. And we need to know more about the criminal justice system. So I hope that my, um, I'm accomplishing my goal. So thank you for calling. Well, yeah, I, I want to say to you, yes, you are. And I, you, I will be calling you as well. Myself. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Good okay. luck. Okay, Hi. thank you for watching. Keep watching us. All right, so um, we're going to read these charges to you. Okay, it's the crime, felony charge of barratry. 
And this is the way a complaint reads. In the name and by the authority of the state of Texas, before me, the undersigned assistant district attorney of Harris County, Texas, this day appeared the undersigned affiant. That's somebody that raised their right hand and they took an oath, says that they have good reason to believe that in Harris County, Johnny Binder Jr., hereafter called the defendant, heretofore on or about January 25th, 2012, with the intent to obtain an economic benefit knowingly in person and by telephone solicited employment for himself by communicating directly to or indirectly through Johnny Binder for the purposes of providing legal representation of a man named Joshua Rito, a prospective client concerning legal representation arising out of a criminal charge in Harris County when neither Joshua Rito nor anyone acting on his behalf of Johnny, uh, Joshua Rito had requested the communication and conduct of Tiffany Mooney was not authorized by the Texas Disciplinary Rules of Professional Conduct on, or any other rule. Let me see if I can take a call. Caller, thank you. You're on. Thank you. Make sure you uh, turn your volume down so you don't echo and just ask your question. I did. I did. Thank oh, thank you. Thank you. I just heard someone in the background. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. I'm calling. Um, I believe my volume is down. Are you having feedback? Yes, ma'am. It's down all the way now. Okay, great. Sorry uh, for that feedback. I'm just calling to say that I really have enjoyed the show today. I almost didn't watch it. And wanted to know, um, do you guys archive these shows? Is there any way that we can get like a rerun? Because I really want some other people to listen to what uh, Minister Jeremiah has said during the early part of your show. And um, uh, yes, ma'am. I you. do get a, um, the, the manager here does send me, e each, each uh, sh episode is run 12 times, and if you call back to the station between 8 and 5, I think they can tell you the re rerun time, but each show is rerun 12 times. All right, great. Great job. Keep up the good work, and let him know that we are sending our prayers for him. Thank, Thank you. you. I hear you. Thank you. Thank you, sweetheart. I appreciate you for calling. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I'm getting a lot of prayers today. Okay, a lot of prayers. We always can use prayers. Yes. Thank, thank God. Um, now, th there's a lot more to the probable cause. I don't know if you want us to read it, but just talking no. about the crime. Now, we're not going to go into that. Okay, just talking about the crime itself. Um, so that's so the way that the government has to prove this case is to prove that um, he solicited someone uh, in the courthouse, and um, that's basically it. Um, he has to be indicted within 90 days, and indictment is where. Uh, a grand jury of 12 decide, the DAs go into this private secret proceeding and they just, and the grand jurors decide whether or not it's more probable than not that it might have happened, like 51%. And if they say yes, they indict, which that means they true bill it, and it goes back to the court, and then he can stand charges to go to trial. Uh, we got another call. Caller, you're on. Thanks for calling. Yes, how you doing, Vivian and uh, Johnny Biden today? Yes, how you doing? I'm doing good. Hey, I, I just called to say, uh, you know, I remember you from back in the day, too, and I was uh, I was once in the game. I was inspired by you, you know, by the game, but I got out of the game, too. And I appreciate what you're doing, and uh, I think uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be inspired to do what you're doing now, too. I want to help people, too. And uh, Vivian King, uh, I appreciate what you're doing. I love your show, and I, I don't miss it. I'm, I got cooked, cooked on it. <laughs> oh, you're so sweet for saying that. Thank you. I'm just trying to educate the people. So uh, just pass the word What's around, this? and... Um, have as many people watch as possible because this is your opportunity to ask questions about the criminal justice system. I'll answer any questions that you have. I'm, an, I'm a legal expert. Uh, and uh, uh, Minister Jeremiah wants to say something. I want to say to you, young man, that I just came from United Methodist Church today around about 2 o'clock, and I spoke to a lot of young boys and young girls. I speak to millions of boys and young girls all over America. I will never stop. God has given me this job. Uh, I'm a spokesperson. I don't work for man. I work for God. I have never told anyone in life that I'm a, uh, a lawyer. I respect lawyers. I wish them well. I don't want to be one. If I did, I go to school. I'm smart enough to read the book. I like what I'm doing and saving lives. And I answer nobody but God. I will prove that I've never done that. Um, I already got a tape. I'm going to walk don't down the hall. Don't talk about the case anymore. I won't talk about it. But I can prove, sir. I don't have to solicit nobody. Everybody knows Johnny Binder. It's Minister Jeremiah. And I got calls from all over the country calling me to help. So I, I don't have to solicit nobody. It's a lie. And a young man got a crack cocaine case, so he's trying to get him some help. But he won't get it on me. 
Well, uh, I wish y'all luck in the world, and uh, you know you overcome a lot of things, and you're you gonna come out of this here uh, just as well too. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your prayers. Keep keep them in thought, and just make sure that we. You, we all want a safe community, and we all want to be fair and impartial and be a part of the community. I get so tired of people not wanting to participate. So thanks for your participation. I hope you're registered to vote, and I hope you uh, stay engaged in the community. I will, and uh, I'll I stay in touch with you, too. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All right. So uh, we have about 12 more minutes. So mm -hmm. tell us something else. You don't want me to read the rest of the problem. Oh, I, I was also no. explaining about the indictment. And so, oh. Looks like we have another call. Come on. Come on with it. What's it? Hello? Call, you're on. Oops. I messed up. Call, you're on. What happened? She said. Call, you're on. Turn it down. Turn it down. Yes. Uh, yes, I would like to say. I don't know if y'all heard about when uh, Clarence Bradford was running for uh, district attorney for Harris County. Oh, yeah, I, I remember. And, uh, and uh, like, they voted, like, a straight Democrat ticket during that time. That when Obama was running. And it's ironic how Adrian Garcia, which was a Democrat, won because of benefiting of the straight Democrat ticket. And Clarence Bradford didn't win. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I think it was controversy over that. And I want to know, did y'all even know anything about how they went down and why yeah, federal sure. investigators wouldn't call on that situation? Yeah, I think some people did do some lawsuits about that. I worked really hard on Obama. I actually myself signed up a 1,000 people to register to vote in front of the criminal courthouse, me and about 10 other lawyers, uh, to let people know that even if you're an ex-con, you still have the right to vote as, long as, you, as soon as you get off of parole. Or off probation, so we registered people who didn't never knew that they could vote. Um, when you vote a straight ticket in, in Texas, the reason why it's hard to get judges in the Democrat ticket is because we have more Republicans than we do Democrats, and so the Republicans go straight ticket all the time. But sometimes people voted straight Democrat, but they did not, or they just voted for Obama and they didn't vote for the rest of the ticket. There were people that did, I mean, I like Chief Bradford. I like him a lot. I think he's a fair and honorable man. But there were people that didn't like him because some laws came into effect when he was, you know, when he was the police chief, like the zero tolerance. And a lot of minority boy, boys got hung up in that. So um, Adrian Garcia went a lot on the Hispanic community, on the radio uh, community TV shows, like, and, and, and got a lot of Hispanic votes that might have come out and just voted for him only. So that's what happened. Okay. And uh, thank you for listening. And uh, keep in touch, keep engaged with politics, because we need to get back out there oh, and vote. I would like to also say I really appreciate uh, Minister uh, Jeremiah and what he's doing for the community. Because, you know, he's a true person sent from God. Because if you don't see the other side of it, how can you turn your life around where you can benefit anybody? Uh, I, I totally agree. Um, and I fight for justice down in the courthouse, too, so I definitely understand. And it's definitely difficult uh, because people don't always think like we do and, and don't always understand, you know, how our young people think. And so it, it, is, it, it is definitely a battle. But thank you for listening and stay engaged thank in the you. community. And thank you for giving and, and, and my prayers also go to you as well as Minister Jeremiah. And thank you. Thank God. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you thank so you. much for calling, sweetheart. And My thank you God. for your question about politics. Not many people call in and ask about that, and it is very important because a lot of times we have 37 criminal judges, and most people don't even know when they're on the ballot or they're on the ballot. Well, and so sure. it is important. I'm, I'm going to say this, you know, because I know you need more time. It's very rare that if you go down to a Harris County and, and get a jury case, that it, it'll be maybe about four blacks. It's very rare. You're going to get mostly. Anglos, maybe a couple of Latinos, and how is everything going to be fair when and it's supposed to be by your peers, but you never get your peers in Harris County. Well, well let, let me just make, let me, let me make this comment, and this Another is why I'm, I'm, I'm having this show. We got to come, though. You know, we sit back as minorities and say, oh, uh, those people are going to do what they want to do. But no, we are the people. You got to come to jury duty. You Two have minutes. to volunteer to give your, you know, your time to make sure that the right things happen, that the, the bad people go to jail and the good people are let go. And we, as, as minorities, have to sacrifice our time to do that. 
and we don't no, do it. I never it. got picked. I never, all the time, I'm, I don't have faith in that well, just be, anymore. Just uh, be, have faith, have faith, work with us, work with us, and just be fair, and uh, uh, just make sure when you go down, you can be fair and impartial, okay? If you say that, that's the magic words to get on a We job. love you. Come on. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for calling, and watch us next Wednesday, okay? Thank you. love you. Thank you. Uh, I want to say something before the show is over. Okay. Um, and I have to say that this is me. Um, I'm not going to sit here and not going to sit on TV tomorrow when I do my press conference. I have never told nobody I'm a lawyer nowhere on the planet. I have never solicited nobody nowhere on the planet. And I will not take this charge. I will win this charge. I will prove to the world I didn't do this. And I will keep on fighting for my people. I'm popular enough. Everybody know, not everybody, but most people know Johnny Biden, the criminal system. So I get so many calls that I, I just tell the secretary, just call somebody, just tell them and give them the cases. So, and, and I got about 30 witnesses. So, and, I, and they mad because of this case, Childress, and then we just got another boy off a of life sentence. And then another capital murder case, we got a boy four year probation. And I, I looked at Malcolm X movie the other day, and they saying there's too much power for that one man. I don't have no power. They fighting against God. So when in the rest, they fighting against God, they think it's me. I'm going to win. I'm going to win. I'm going to pick a dream team. I'm going to win. And I'm going to have no more law you to you. I'm going to win. Can I they take one not... more call right quick? Hurry up. Please, please. Hurry up. Yes, caller, you're on. Yeah, I know you're short on time. I'm going to just make this statement and make it kind of quick like uh, uh, it's kind of ironic that uh, a person can't uh, mention about another lawyer and they uh, and they assume that that lawyer is a good lawyer. Because I know if, if somebody asks me about a lawyer, I'm going to tell them about some people that I do know. And I think, oh, you can do that. No, you can do that. You can, you can tell them about a lawyer if someone asks you about them. You can do that. What we can't do is split fees with you. So you can't, like, say, uh, give me $10,000 and you take five and the lawyer take five and lawyer do all the work. You can't do that. But you can recommend anybody for anything. Do you understand? It, yeah. Now, now, and then another thing we need to realize, too, we have tons of uh, individuals, minorities that's registered to vote. They just don't vote. So we need to start getting those people out to go and vote. And we, we need people such as yourself sitting on that bench up there to administer proper ju uh, judgment. She'll do that. I, I would love to do that. I, I ran last time, uh, two years ago, and you know, lost a, a bunch of money trying to get people out there to vote. But it's hard to do that. I need people to come out there in, in the trenches and help. Uh, like you uh, and community people to get involved. Harris County just doesn't have really good minority activists uh, in, in certain aspects, but not in the political aspect, not That's when right. it comes to political. It might be uh -huh. like Minister Jeremiah helping uh, poor people like himself. I help people like myself because I came from bad, you know, a bad environment. Um, and people are doing their small causes and their 5013Cs, but it's no one out there like a Jesse Jackson or you know, Al Sharpton. We don't have people in the political arena. And I'd love to see some young people get involved with politics because we need that in Houston. We need a political force. Uh, and I'd love for you to get involved. We're going to wrap this up. We have five minutes. And please watch next week. And um, uh, keep, 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 keep the comments coming in. Thank you for watching. Do you want to tell Johnny, uh, Jeremiah anything? Yeah, I just want to wish him uh, uh, good luck and uh, just keep his head up. I, I, I've known him a, a long time, and Thank you. Uh, I, I, I wish him all, all the well that is, and the uh, Lord be with him. God bless Thank you. you. Thank you. All right, we have five minutes. Again, Vivian. The, the, and the, you know I don't want you to talk about your case. I'm not. Okay. These people don't know what they're doing. I'm a, I'm, I'm a living legend in Harris County in the state of Texas. They're going to see. Uh, I got almost... 200 people have called in already. I got about 30 people already signed an affidavit, what they know, and people been calling them, asking them, was I'm a lawyer, and they know I've never said that. So well, I'm, do you think that there could have been just an honest mistake? I mean, I, I don't, you know. You talking about the young guy? Yeah, I mean. I from, from the beginning, for real, I love a little child. It was an honest mistake. Right. He couldn't remember Miss Tiffany Mooney's name. So in the car, was in the pocket. All I was in the pocket, I would just pull a card out and right. said Tiffany Mooney. He forgot. Do you think that sometimes it's because of your flamboyant personality that you, like, overtook her personality and maybe so Sometimes that happened, but not this time. Okay. Because he came to the office. He knows Johnny Binder. We talked about the dope game. Okay. I tried to get him in real estate. I said, you need to stop buying that dope and get in real estate. Right. Because he got caught with four grams of crack cocaine in his car. So I said, dude. I've been started telling y'all, stop buying dope, buy dirt. You buy dirt, you, 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 you don't go to prison. You buy cocaine, you go to prison. 
He said, man, you're right. He said, I'm getting out the game. I'm getting out. I'm getting out. I said, well, we'll see you in the morning. He put the nine on laws down, the two secretaries. Did it? I don't want you to talk okay, about Okay, I apologize. This case. I won't. But anyhow, make a long story short, when she say, who's your lawyer, he got jammed up and said Johnny Bonder. I don't use that name no more. I go by Minister Jeremiah. And she said, did he tell you that? Then he fathered the lie and said it again. So again, uh, the young man has made a great mistake. And uh, I pray for him. I really do because God is mad with him right now. He shouldn't have lied on me. And now they done made a deal with him. So he's lying again. So I know he's trying to get him a time because bless his little heart. But he won't get one on me. Well, we have two minutes and I'm going to wrap this up. Hopefully I can sum up that um, Minister Jeremiah is very angry about this case. And he's done a beautiful job in correcting his life, trying to make a living for himself since he has been to prison. And uh, he's very popular, very flamboyant. People know him. Hopefully it's a misunderstanding. Um, I have no personal knowledge. I know that I see him in the courthouse every day. Um, I know that he's helped some people. I'm sure people are m mad with him. I fight for people every day. People get mad with me. I don't know the, the full facts and the full story, but I wanted people to be inspired by his story. He always planned to tell his story. So um, I wanted you to be inspired. Hopefully we'll have a follow-up show uh, as this progresses so that he can talk a little bit more about how his case is progressing and um, all the good things that he's done in the community. I hope I've cleared up what is the crime of barratry. I hope we've learned something tonight. It, that could be for a doctor, lawyer, any profession that has rules that say you can't fee split. It could be a dentist. So I think doctors are also charged with barratry or people holding themselves out as doctors or lawyers or splitting the fees with them. I think you've learned a little bit more about the grand jury process. Uh, Minister Jeremiah's case has not gone before the grand jury. That has to be done 90 days from the day of his charges, which he was charged, um, I think, on Monday or, or last Friday. Um, I think you've learned a little bit more about the process. 60 jurors have come in. His case is in the 339th District Court. And I hope that he gets a fair trial in Harris County. I hope we all participate as informed citizens. And I hope you watch us next week where we talk about another interesting topic in the criminal justice system where we hear it from the person standpoint. I want to try to educate people with the, little, with the knowledge that I have as a legal expert. And I have one, as he said, um, a lawyer of the year. And uh, I've been blessed to help a lot of people who were yes, innocent. Sure. I have uh, worked really hard for people who didn't do it and, um, you know, keeping them from going to prison. A lot of times they're young and they don't appreciate it, so I don't hear from them anymore. But I, I have done that a lot in the past. And I've helped, I've helped a lot of people. And I hope I'm helping you tonight uh, by telling you about uh, the criminal justice system. Well, I just want to say publicly, uh, Johnny Binder, also known as Minister Jeremiah, I wish you absolutely the best. Thank you. And I know you have helped a lot of people. And I will certainly be supporting you every step of the way. Thank you. And, um, and I'm sure the community will be doing that also. We got a lot of great calls yes, tonight. Yes, So watch us next week with Truth and Justice with Vivian King as we bring you another true crime story where we try to seek the truth. Thank you so much for watching. Oh my God.